This is PDV Fools. I am Sayyid Shabahat Ali. And you are watching False Lines. In February 2024, the Russia's invasion on Ukraine will complete its two years. On 24th of February 2022, Russia had started this war against Ukraine, which was initially expected to be a short military skirmish. But it turned out to be one of the major wars that Europe has seen ever since World War II has been concluded. This war has caused catastrophic destruction for Ukraine and a lot of political and military meltdown for Russia. In today's program, we will see what has happened in this war, what have been the major events during the last two years, and where does Russia and Ukraine stand as of today. Here is my take. On Russia and Ukraine. On 24 February 2022, Russia launched a surprise attack on Ukraine with airstrike and ground troops from multiple fronts, claiming to support the Russian backed separatists in Donbass region. By June 2022, Russian forces occupied about 20% of Ukrainian territory, including parts of Kiev, Kharkiv, and Odessa. In July 2022, Ukraine received military and humanitarian aid from NATO, EU, and United States, as well as diplomatic support from the United Nations Security Council, which condemned Russia's aggression and imposed sanctions. In September 2022, a ceasefire was brokered by France and Germany, but it was repeatedly violated by both the sides, leading to clashes and casualties. In February 2023, Russia launched a new offensive with more troops and more weapons, breaking the ceasefire and advancing further into Ukrainian territory, targeting strategic infrastructure in civilian areas. In December 2023, the war entered a stalemate, with neither side able to gain significant ground or inflict decisive damage, and with mounting human and economic costs as well as environmental and humanitarian crisis. It's very pertinent to tell you here that meanwhile, particularly in the last part of year 2023, the financial support for Ukraine had started drying out and the United States was a bit reluctant to fund this war any further. But we surprisingly, uh, the President Joe Biden, uh, with the support of his party, uh, the U.S. Senate has finally passed a $95 billion war fund support for Israel and Ukraine. And Ukraine's uh, share out of it is $64 billion. That is a staggering financial support, more than the United States would have done for any other nation in the recent past. To talk about these very pertinent development in today's program, I have invited an expert. His name is Tamur Khan. He is a geopolitical and foreign policy analyst who specializes in the area of Russia. Tamur, I welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me. It is uh, always a pleasure to be on your show. Tamur, my first question is, what are uh, the objectives of both the sides, particularly in the Battle of Avdivka, uh, which is thought to be one of strategically very important areas uh, as long as the Russia's war on Ukraine is concerned? Uh, the battle for Avdivka near Donetsk uh, sees Ukraine defending a strategic town that blocks uh, Russian access to Donetsk uh, city and its resources. Avdivka's fortifications and its coke plant are pivotal, with Ukraine using um, entrenched defenses to maintain control. Um, Russia aims to encircle uh, the Ukrainian forces fighting in that town, employing airstrikes, artillery and ground troops to capture the town. Uh, which is viewed as a crucial uh, point for controlling the Donetsk and Luhansk regions and boosting morale. Um, the intense combat reflects the town's significance uh, in the border conflict uh, over eastern Ukraine. This battle is also becoming highly uh, similar to the one that was fought uh, for the town of Bakhmut uh, last year between the Ukrainian and the Russian armed forces. This battle is also uh, you know, becoming very costly uh, whether you talk about in terms of uh, strategy or tactics or even in terms of uh, human losses or personnel losses uh, for that matter. Both sides recognize the strategic importance uh, of Avdivka in the broader conflict over the Donbas uh, region, 
uh, with its uh, control having implications for uh, the territorial control, uh, military logistics, and the psychological aspect of the conflict. Uh, how important or significant is Ukraine's hold on uh, the right bank of uh, Dnipro River, if I'm pronouncing it correctly? And what can be the strategic uh, objectives behind uh, this recent push? Ukraine's breakthrough on the eastern bank of the Dnipro River is highly significant. Um, making one of the few counteroffensive uh, successes for the Ukrainian army ever since the uh, second counteroffensive began last year. The special forces uh, faced challenges such as adapting their tactics after the destruction of a dam uh, that happened last year and also dealing with the high waters that were a result of, uh, of that dam's breakage. Uh, securing a crossing required not just crossing the river itself, but also establishing a bridgehead with sufficient uh, backup to hold that uh, bridgehead as well, because the Russian forces continuously uh, tried to regain control of uh, that uh, bridgehead as well. The operation involved high-risk missions, um, including night operations and coordination uh, with surrendered Russian troops uh, for intelligence. Um, despite these efforts, Ukrainian forces face challenges like freezing temperatures and being under-equipped uh, and uh, under-resourced compared to the Russian forces uh, that are operating nearby, making holding and advancing extremely difficult for the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, recently, another uh, Russian naval ship has been sunk uh, by the Ukrainian uh, military. Uh, well, they are claiming that they have uh, hit it with drones, which has uh, been... Um, contested by the Russian side as well. But what can be the advantage of it or how how well footed do you think Russia's Navy is at the moment after this very recent incident? Uh, well, you see the Ukrainian uh, sea drones uh, sinking of the Russian uh, warship significantly shifts uh, the naval power dynamics in the Black Sea. Uh, it also highlights Ukraine's uh, extended reach and capability to directly challenge the Russian naval strength uh, in that region as well. The attack uh, near the Novorossiya port, which severely damaged the Russian uh, warship, showcases an increase in um, the Ukrainian naval drone effectiveness and operational range as well. Uh, this is part of a series of Ukrainian strikes on Russian naval assets, exemplified by the notable sinking uh, of the Tarantul-class missile corvette uh, Ivanovets, if I remember correctly. Uh, furthermore, these attacks or these actions also underscore uh, Ukraine's enhanced naval strategy and pose a significant challenge uh, to Russia's naval dominance in the Black Sea, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the cost-effective use of uh, sea drones allows Ukraine to target Russia's uh, superior naval forces effectively. Moreover, it also uh, has resulted in the shifting uh, of uh, the region's uh, control balance as well. Uh, which has also led to Russia to adjust uh, its Black Sea fleet's positioning, uh, moving from uh, Sevastopol to Novorossiysk, and uh, considering further relocations to mitigate the Ukrainian threats. Um, uh, in addition, I'll also like to say that these developments have complex implications for conflict resolution as well. Uh, while Ukraine's naval successes might deter Russian aggression and open avenues for diplomatic dialogue, uh, but they also risk escalating tensions and complicating peace efforts. Um, Ukraine's strategic deployment of uh, naval drones marks a shift in modern warfare dynamics and uh, power in the region, uh, which is also necessitating careful uh, navigation by both parties in uh, future negotiations. Russia has uh, recently uh, conducted rocket attacks on Kiev and Lviv, uh, two different cities of Ukraine. How important or how significant are these developments? Well, uh, you see, Russia's missile and drone strikes on Ukrainian cities like Kiev and Lviv uh, mark a major escalation, uh, causing civilian casualties and widespread damage. Uh, in Kiev, uh, missile debris destroyed part of the residential high-rise, uh, underscoring the severe impact on civilians. Uh, Ukraine has rallied, uh, also rallied its uh, services uh, to address the fallout. Uh, showing strong resolve against uh, these Russian attacks. And the Ukrainian military, although has successfully intercepted many attacks, um, highlighting efforts to strengthen air defenses. Uh, however, the persistence of these assaults pose, uh, pose uh, significant challenges to uh, safeguarding urban centers and inhabitants of those uh, urban centers as well. 
In response, President Zelensky has pursued global discussions, uh, including talks on Ukraine's future with the World Bank leader uh, and sought international aid for defense and rebuilding. Um, I think that this approach aims for strategic offensive uh, moves and a comprehensive recovery plan, considering the use of frozen Russian assets for reconstruction and holding Russia responsible for such actions. Um, and also, I would also like to mention that amid ongoing conflict, Ukraine's resilience and determination to secure both defensive support and reconstruction aid uh, reflects a proactive engagement with the international community, which can also uh, create problems for uh, the Russian foreign policy orientation and overtures in the future as well. There are uh, certainly uh, many humanitarian costs associated with every uh, war. So certainly there is a human cost of this Ukraine's conflict as well. Uh, how do you see the civilian cost of this conflict which is gaining further momentum uh, despite the fact that the war has completed its first two years. Well, uh, you see the recent reports highlight that civilians uh, in uh, Ukraine's uh, conflict zones uh, face severe challenges such as displacement, access to essentials, healthcare strain, educational disruptions and uh, psychological traumas uh, to say the least. Um, millions are displaced internally and abroad, causing a housing and safety crisis uh, for those civilians. And then destroyed infrastructure hampers uh, access to food, water and medical supplies and other basic utilities. Um, the conflict has also overwhelmed healthcare systems with damaged, damaged facilities and uh, dwindling supplies. Um, the damaged schools and the displacement of children threaten future education and development of the Ukrainian uh, public. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, the psychological trauma, the widespread violence has had a deep mental impact on the population as well. Um, uh, furthermore, the international efforts led by organizations like NATO and the UN, uh, they do aim to provide relief through humanitarian aid, health care and education support amidst challenges. Uh, posed by the conflict's unpredictability, logistical hurdles and uh, security concerns, but I think that uh, still more needs to be done. Uh, although uh, there are several countries uh, wh whose own resources are extremely strained, uh, especially inside of Europe, uh, because of the ongoing uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, but still uh, it is the need of the hour that more needs to be done and more resources need to be pulled by those countries in order to help uh, the Ukrainian public uh, more uh, holistically and comprehensively. And in the end, I would like to add that uh, the need for ongoing global support is critical to meet the escalating humanitarian uh, demands and to seek a lasting solution uh, to the conflict, which is uh, imperative uh, at the moment with multiple other global conflicts sprouting uh, in different parts of the globe. And how do you assess the role of NATO and other international major actors uh, that have been formally engaged in this war? Well, um, as far as uh, NATO's role uh, is concerned, I think that NATO has played a significant and varied role in supporting Ukraine uh, during its conflict with Russia, um, offering everything from political to military support and aid uh, since the conflict escalated uh, in 2014 and uh, uh, also uh, after the special military operation, as the Russians call it, uh, in February of 2022. Uh, two years ago. Um, the alliance has steadfastly backed uh, Ukraine's sovereignty and uh, security, um, supporting its self-defense rights and uh, Euro-Atlantic integration ambitions as well. Uh, moreover, the public support in Ukraine uh, for joining NATO uh, has surged significantly, particularly in response to uh, the Russian aggression, uh, a goal which is now enshrined in the Ukrainian constitution, which I might add. Uh, however, Ukraine's path to NATO uh, membership faces uh, daunting hurdles including the need for reforms and Russia's uh, oppression. And here I'll also like to add that uh, according to uh, the 1949 North Atlantic Treaty uh, Charter of NATO, uh, any country which has a frozen conflict or a pending territorial dispute with any, with any other country uh, can also uh, uh, not join a NATO organization. And since Russia has uh, almost turned uh, the current conflict into a frozen conflict, I think uh, this further exacerbates uh, Ukraine's uh, problems uh, uh, for joining NATO uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, moreover, I'll also like to add that uh, in response to the conflict, uh, NATO allies have increased support uh, to address Ukraine's immediate uh, needs, including military assistance and help to counter economic and infrastructural impacts uh, of the war. 
Uh, this coordinated uh, effort aims to alleviate the humanitarian situation for civilians and enhance uh, Ukraine's defense mechanisms as well. Uh, and uh, in the end, I would like to say that the situation continues to remain fluid uh, with challenges in providing adequate and timely support. Uh, however, balancing immediate aid with long-term security, uh, long security and reconstruction alongside continuous uh, dialogue between Ukraine, NATO and the international community is key to addressing the current needs and achieving regional stability and security and a peaceful resolution to the conflict uh, in the long term. Thank you very much, Tamur, for being guest in our show. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break and we'll join you back for the second segment of the program. Stay with us. Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, as we had also discussed in the previous program, Pakistan's general election for 2024 have been concluded. The same parliamentary parties are back in the parliament with a different equation of representation. And apparently it seems that they are going to form a joint coalition. While the coalition of these parties is, is still uh, being discussed, there is an elephant in the room and that is the financial situation. The nominated prime minister's candidate from PMLN, the political party that has maximum representation in the upcoming National Assembly's session, uh, is Mia Muhammad Shahbaz Sharif, who has hinted during a television interview that Pakistan will have to immediately enroll into a new IMF program worth at least six billion US dollars. Now, that reminds us of the economic challenges that the new government will have to face in the first year of uh, its inception. To talk about Pakistan's economic situation at large, we have invited today an economist who uh, is quite expert of uh, talking about macroeconomics and frequently appears in our show. His name is Dr. Mahmoud Khalid, who is an economist uh, and works for Pakistan Institute of Developing Economics. Dr. Mahmoud Khalid, I welcome you to the show. Thank you very much, Shabad, for having me on the program. It's always a pleasure. Dr. first of all, give us a background of our relationship with IMF. So to my understanding, we are about to conclude one of their programs and the conditionalities that had been extended by IMF have so far been fully met by the government of Pakistan. Uh, help me to understand the situation between Pakistan and IMF at the moment. Now, this is a very important question, uh, not just for the caretaker government, which is uh, going to wrap up. Rather, it is more important for the upcoming government uh, because uh, the IMF has been uh, seen as a, a kind of a lender of last resort for our balance of payment crisis. Uh, but that doesn't come without a cost and they have uh, identified a set of uh, recommendations which they call as conditionalities to be met. Earlier it was a post program but now it also comes as a precondition. Uh, we were in a standby arrangement uh, for the uh, last year for about uh, 3 billion dollars in which uh, in November the last tranche of uh, 700 million was also released. Uh, in which uh, they have notified uh, that uh, certain commitments which were made were fulfilled. Uh, now within that the uh, uh, kind of uh, portfolio which they have uh, provided uh, is mostly in terms of uh, managing the fiscal side, uh, especially in terms of the circular debts which has been created in the energy sector. And that requires the government actually to pass on uh, the higher energy cost to the consumers. Besides that, the IMF has also required us to uh, improve the foreign exchange market by making the foreign exchange uh, totally based on the market forces. And uh, along with that, they have asked for another set of uh, recommendations on the sides of these uh, uh, state-owned enterprises, which needs to be actually uh, uh, privatized. Now, having said that, uh, the IMF has been um, happy in terms of how the government has been uh, accepting their conditionalities towards the improvement of the system. But it is coming with a cost because uh, 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 the strict monetary policy regime to counter the inflation has resulted into 
uh, a policy rate of close to 22% and that has actually led to a fiscal crisis in terms of debt servicing. Whereas uh, now, uh, as of the last quarter, around 95% of our tax revenues has to be paid to uh, cover for our debt servicing cost. So these sort of problems are also there, but definitely the uh, government is looking forward uh, to go back again to the IMF program. And we have also noticed that before the new government steps in, uh, Pakistan has jacked up the prices of uh, petroleum gas, uh, of petroleum and, uh, and liquid gas. Uh, so do you think it is somehow associated with the conditions that we have committed with IMF and what is going to be the economic impact of this price uh, escalation? Yes, indeed. Uh, now, the problem with uh, such types of energy tariff hikes is that it is not just going to impact the uh, cost of production for the businesses, but also to the ordinary people in terms of increasing the cost of their living in the form of uh, energy use uh, for their cooking and other purposes. Now what happens is that uh, when you are passing on uh, these uh, tariff hikes, uh, the reason is that there is a huge uh, circular debt at the back uh, which the government now cannot uh, fund from uh, borrowing uh, because already the size is enormous. But besides that, since the private sector's credit availability from the bank also reduces because now the government is borrowing for that purpose. Now, the problem which we see from outside is that it's not just about passing the tariffs to recover the cost. The problem actually lies in the governance structure and this is what uh, PAID has also been working in terms of suggesting that there are certain governance related changes which needs to happen, both for the uh, gas sector as well as for the uh, electricity sector and until unless you do that still the same kinds of higher tariffs needed to be passed on to the consumers and this is something which is unsustainable. Dr. Shab, you had discussed in one of our previous shows that Pakistan owes about 24 billion dollars in terms of external debts for which needs to be paid back in the current financial year. Uh, so what is the preparation or what options does the upcoming government have in terms of paying back these uh, external loans? Yes, and uh, this is something which uh, actually is a chronic problem for the Pakistan's economy that we are not uh, uh, managing to secure enough foreign exchange reserves to pay out our liabilities. Now, uh, for a country like Pakistan, which has a current account deficit, that means they have to fund their expense for commodities and input purchase from the rest of the world by either remittances or by taking loans. And this is what we have been doing in the past. But uh, owing to costly borrowing uh, in the recent past, now we have to actually serve their debt. And as you have rightly mentioned that this year, uh, the next year, the, by the June 30th, we have to actually honor a payment of about $24 billion. And currently, the position is very bleak in terms of our resource or the reserve position. Uh, we don't have even a cover for three months uh, import uh, in, in the form of reserves with uh, the state bank and the uh, domestic banking sector. It is close to about uh, uh, 13 uh, odd uh, uh, billion dollars in which uh, 8 billion dollars are with the central bank and uh, with the banking sector uh, it's close to 5 billion dollars. Now how is it going to be managed? That is what uh, is uh, most uh, prominent or million dollar question for the upcoming government and I'm sure they're going to try to go to the IMF seeking um, another program loan because what happens is that when you are taking a program loan uh, it kind of increases your credibility towards the other creditors which can facilitate you in terms of providing for the necessary loans. But again, this is going to be a short term solution until unless you see it from a long term perspective where the uh, things needs to improve, especially the current account deficits, uh, this problem is going to emerge again and again. Another six billion dollars uh, of loan is expected to be initiated by the government of Pakistan from IMF. Uh, what do you think can be the political cost of uh, such a loan? Uh, because IMF always comes up with conditions that have a huge political cost. Now, there are always political costs for the programs of IMF, whether it's Pakistan or any other country. 
because it comes with certain preconditions and it also requires certain structural reforms. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, targeting of the reforms is merely to provide a kind of an emergency relief. For example, they're going to uh, focus on the trade deficit, they're going to, uh, sorry, not the trade deficit, the budget deficits, they're also going to try to plug in uh, some kinds of uh, tariff uh, adjustments and others. But what they miss to actually uh, propose is something which is needed by the economy at that time. Uh, like for example, in case of Pakistan, the projection is that the real economic growth is going to be close to 1.5 to 2 percent. Uh, but uh, does it match even our population growth requirement? Or does it actually provide for enough jobs in the economy to happen? This is a very, uh, I think, important question to address while we are looking for the IMF program. So when we are addressing, and this is something which we cannot avoid, but while going to the IMF program, we should do our homework in terms of providing plausible solutions for these crises. And there are alternatives which can be affixed. And uh, number one is basically uh, providing some relief in the form of governance reforms in which the civil uh, bureaucracy itself is an issue because they actually manage all the things. Uh, then the governance uh, problems which we have earlier mentioned in the form of energy and uh, sector. Then we have also uh, identified that there are problems in terms of how the government is actually borrowing. Uh, PIDE has uh, many a times recommended that there should be a, a single debt office including the national savings and the uh, treasury department to seek for loans. So there are plenty of other options which can also be worked out while we are going to the IMF in terms of seeking another uh, program loan. But Dr. Shab, you had once uh, spoken in one of my programs about the PSDP projects and the hanging liabilities uh, that it has for the government. Help us to understand why does it become more difficult for the upcoming government to announce more development projects and their PSDP program? Well, you are very rightly identified that the public asset management in Pakistan is very poor, especially the public sector development program. The projects identification, the complete project cycle actually, uh, from right from the project identification up till its completion. It's not actually embedded in a kind of a strategy towards economic growth or actually delivering what it ought to. So the problem right now is uh, very significant. You have rightly identified the throw forward of the public sector development program is close to uh, 9 trillion rupees. And by looking at the uh, the uh, public sector development program overall budget, uh, almost 15 to uh, 20 years are needed just to complete the existing projects. Uh, what to talk about the new projects which also come in. We have got elaborate frameworks. We have got a public financial management uh, set act which actually governs the new uh, paradigm for the public sector development program. But unfortunately, the uh, changes which are uh, due has not uh, taken place. Uh, we have been recommending that the uh, public asset management from the public, uh, not just from the PSDP, but overall needs to be done in a manner where it is linked with the results. And it is also uh, providing some kind of uh, economic growth uh, uh, framework rather than simply eating away the public resources and not delivering what it ought to. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud Khalid, for being guest in our show. Thank you very much, Sabad, for having me on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break. And we'll join you back with the last segment of the program. Stay with us. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the last segment of the show. And in this segment, we are going to talk about one of the most pertinent problems that every corner of planet Earth is facing. This is perhaps the only issue which does not allow any human on planet Earth to be aware of its impact. And that is the issue of climate change. Climate change, something that we have been frequently talking about in our show, is affecting different areas of planet Earth, uh, starting from South America to the desert of Africa to the wild forest stretches of Australian continent to uh, the wildest strategy, uh, stretches of uh, Amazon as well. While this has been a global issue, we have seen very little action by the governments as well as uh, very little changes 
in our lifestyles as individuals. Here is what my take is on the issues of environment and climate change. A series of wildfires begun in Chile on 30th January 2024, affecting several regions and causing a state of emergency. The fire were driven by heat wave, drought, and suspected arson and burned more than 430,000 hectares of land. At least 26 people died and more than 2,000 were injured by the fire and over 100 uh, 1,500 homes were destroyed. Uh, meanwhile, Africa is seeing one of its worst droughts. The Horn of Africa is facing uh, this drought situation, in, which is one of the recent environmental challenges worsened by conflict, COVID-19, and rising food prices. Around 23 million people are facing acute hunger, and 7.5 million children are acutely malnourished in Somalia, Ethiopia, and Kenya. The drought has led to large-scale displacement, outbreaks of diseases, and loss of livestock and crops. Meanwhile, Greenland's ice sheet is melting faster than expected due to climate change and other factors contributing to global sea level rise. Greenland is currently losing 234 billion tons of ice every year, which is equally in two filling 6,324 Empire State buildings every year. The ice sheet is sensitive to changes in temperature and precipitation and has experienced more frequent and intense surface melting in recent years. And let me also remind you that the northeastern U.S. coast was hit by a powerful snowstorm in December 2023, breaking records in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and New York. The storm caused travel chaos, power outage, school closures, and hundreds of flight cancellations and delays. The storm also brought coastal flooding and icy conditions, leading to car accidents and fatalities. Ladies and gentlemen, as we have discussed this problem covering various parts of Earth, let's invite an expert, Ms. Namira Hamid, who is joining me from London on Skype, and ask her quickly. What is her take on these environmental challenges? Namira, I welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me. Namira, what caused the forest fire in Chile? And this must be a very concerning development for you as an expert of environment. South America is facing unprecedented high temperatures. This January was the hottest on record globally, and many countries are still trying to deal with the devastating wildfires that have torn across the continent. Chile has been the most affected country with uh, over 100 people dying in fires. The country saw casualties last year as well from the summer wildfires. So these recent forest fires in Chile and Argentina have highlighted the need for better and more ambitious environmental laws as um, the climate crisis worsens. Our discussions on this topic cannot just be focused on the science of climate change and carbon emissions. We need to simultaneously talk about climate finance, climate justice, and the social impacts of climate change. On climate finance, we need to see the $100 billion per year from high-income countries to low-income countries that are most affected by the crisis. Uh, additionally, we need to also see national plans to mitigate uh, carbon emissions as we adapt to these new realities and horrors of climate change. This requires international collaboration across sectors um, and the need for a just transition. All of what I said uh, depends on public engagement. Uh, the more the public and the citizens are engaged, the better the policies will come out internationally from each of the countries. We saw um, that the loss and damage fund was one due to immense pressure from uh, activists and campaigners and young citizens from around the world. So climate justice and the clean energy transition is simply not possible without bringing people from every um, community and uh, every segment of society onto the journey uh, that we need for um, a net zero and low carbon future. And how does the ice sheet of Greenland concern you? Because we are seeing Greenland losing most of its ice in the recent years. I mean, the meltdown that it has had in the previous years is far lesser than the recent meltdowns that we have seen. How concerned are you on this development as an expert? 
AMOC is a marine conveyor belt that carries heat, carbon and nutrients from the tropics towards the Arctic Circle, uh, where it cools and sinks into the deeper ocean. So this circulation helps to distribute energy around the Earth and balance off uh, the impact of global heating that is caused by human activities. What we're seeing now is that the circulation of the Atlantic Ocean is heading towards a tipping point, which would be catastrophic for the climate system and humanity. We don't yet know how soon this would happen, but we know that scientists doing this research are shocked at the forecasted speed of collapse once the point is reached. Um, as the glaciers in Greenland and Arctic ice sheets are melting faster than expected, the system is being uh, severely impacted as it pours more and more fresh water into the sea. So we know that the AMOC has declined 15% since 1950 and is currently in its weakest state in more than 1,000 years or more. What do we learn from this? We learn that we need ambitious climate policies immediately. Uh, decision makers tend to shy away from strong climate action, saying that their citizens may not support ambitious policies and climate financing. Our research from Climate Outreach shows that there are, in fact, very high levels of support for government leaders to take urgent uh, climate action. Um, public is increasingly concerned about climate justice and policymakers are just not keeping up with it. Concern on action is growing in every corner of the globe. The longer we leave urgent and ambitious responses, the more dire the situation becomes. Thank you all much, Namira, for being guest in our show. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, the environmental issues and uh, the climate change is something that is going to affect every citizen of this world, every inhabitant of this world. We need to make sure that our actions really uh, respond to the calamities. Otherwise, our coming generations will have to live in a world which will not have a tolerable climate. We'll join you next week with another program. And until then, allow us.